Hello, my name is Aaron Heckroth, and I'm here to talk to you about Brute Force, our Java-based ray tracing engine. So we're going to start with the basics. Uh, how does light work? Well, light sources generate light rays. Those rays can then interact with objects, uh, and eventually rays meet your eye. Your eye can interpret the color of those rays and reconstruct an image in your brain. Ray tracers work by placing a camera where that eye would be. Uh, that camera then emits vision rays through the pixels in the screen in the other direction. Uh, those rays can hit objects, and if they do, those objects can then look toward light sources to determine whether or not they're lit. Uh, if they are, the lights return their color and strength. Uh, the object can then return its color to the camera, and you have the color of your pixel. And if you repeat this many, many times over all the pixels in your image, you can then reconstruct it and display it to the user. Uh, so the question is, how long does it take us to render a scene containing a certain number of objects? Well, uh, your primary rays, you have as many of them as you have pixels in your scene, and in the worst case, you have as many shadow rays, or uh, object checks to see whether or not they can see the light, as you have number of objects. Uh, so that means that you have R squared N number of operations to do, or O of N if R is constant. And we can do a little bit better than that. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is calculating color, and we use a system called Fong Illumination. Uh, this simplifies light behavior by breaking it down into three basic components. These are the ambient, diffuse, and specular components. Ambient is probably the simplest. It represents light that is constant and indirect in the scene, and that means that any object that you can hit with a primary ray will return its ambient color whether or not there are any lights shining on it at a given time. Uh, the diffuse component uh, refers to light that is absorbed and then re-emitted in all directions by an object's surface. Uh, and so this is determined by the relationship between the position and intensity of the light and the surface of the object. Uh, so this means that uh, if an object can see the light, it can compute a, a diffuse component and return it to the camera. Um, now you'll notice that I've marked the position where a shadow would be of the green object on the blue object, and that's because shadows kind of arise naturally out of this system, because if you can't see the light, then your color will be dark because you are not able to add the light to your diffuse component. Um, the last component is specular, uh, and it represents light that's reflected across an object's surface. And what's interesting about it is that it actually increases depending on the angle between the reflection of the light and the eye of the camera. And so if the eye is looking directly at the specular spot, you have a very, very bright color. Uh, so here's the three components shown on three different spheres, uh, each rendering as only the one component at a time. If we combine these, we get a pretty cool-looking, uh, three-dimensional looking sphere. Uh, and here's an example of light moving around this sphere in a circle to kind of give you an idea of what the illumination model looks like as the orientation of lights relative to the objects changes. The next thing I want to talk about are secondary rays, which are used to calculate reflections and refractions in our scene, and they're basically necessary for realistic lighting. Uh, the nice thing is that we can solve these pretty simply by recursion. Primary rays spawn reflection rays whenever they hit the surface of a reflective object. Uh, these reflection rays bounce off of the surface, uh, and then if they collide with something else, then we can use the same computations that we used before to determine the color of that object. We have it look toward the light, it returns its color, uh, that is returned to the first object, which modifies that color by its reflection parameters, and then returns it to the camera to get the color of the pixel. Uh, we use the same trick to do refraction. So when a primary ray hits a transparent object, it generates a refraction ray that uh, moves through that object at an angle determined by Snell's law. Uh, when it hits the other side of the object, it refracts again. Uh, that ray can then hit another object, it can look for the light, return its color, and we use the same uh, process to get the color of the pixel. Uh, we can do the same thing to solve the problem of the shadows of transparent objects, which would otherwise appear black. Uh, so you can shoot a primary array at an object, have it look toward the light, and if it sees a transparent object instead of a light, it can then generate secondary rays through that object to figure out what the correct color of the shadow should be. Uh, so the question is, how much do these reflections and refractions affect our computation time? And in the worst case, all of our objects are both reflective and transparent, and all rays will hit an object, which means our running time is O of infinity. And that's really bad, and that happens because when you shoot uh, a ray at a transparent reflective object, uh, if it refracts into the object, it bounce around inside of it forever. We solve this problem by limiting the depth of the recursion for any given primary ray, uh, which means that the upper bound on our asymptotic running time is still only O of n. Here's an example of reflections and refractions both taking place in the same scene. Uh, you can see the shadows on the floor that we have recursive shadows going on. The two objects on the floor are both highly reflective, and the object in the center is changing its index of refraction as we move the camera around.
The next thing I want to talk about is optimization or how we make this whole process go faster. And the first one that we use is multi-threading. Uh, multi-threading is nice because it decreases computation time without significantly adding complexity to our system. Uh, since each pixel is already calculated independently, it makes it pretty straightforward to uh, move the same ray casting operations that we're already doing onto multiple cores. In Java, we do this using callables, uh, which can be assigned to a thread. Uh, they run, and when they finish, they return a value. And in our case, that's a color value associated with the specific pixel, which we can then reduce back into the specific uh, color and position in our output image. Uh, and this really depends on how many cores you have, uh, but it can provide an approximately linear performance increase. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have any effect on asymptotic complexity, for which we have another solution. Um, so these are octrees. Octrees divide a scene into quadrants called oct nodes, uh, and scene objects can be placed into oct nodes to accelerate uh, ray intersection operations. And when you do that, you can split an oct node into eight child oct nodes, hence the name, uh, which may or may not also contain the object. Um, and so the trick to using octrees effectively is figuring out how to traverse them. In our case, our traversal algorithm is pretty simple. Uh, you check a ray for collision with the octree, you recursively check all of its children in each layer to determine which ones could be hit, and once you've figured out all of the oct leaves, which are the lowest level nodes in the tree that can contain an object, you check all of them one by one to see which object would be hit first. Here's a 3D example of what it would look like to intersect an octree containing a monkey and some other objects. As you can see, we recursively check each level of the oct tree to figure out which node contains the object we want, and then we're able to run an intersection test on it. One of the nice things about oct trees is that their depth is variable, and we can alter it depending on scene construction. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, we try to use an oct tree with roughly O of log n layers. Uh, our previous running time for calculating scenes was O of n, uh, and in the worst case, oct trees don't help us at all. Uh, the nice thing is that rays can't hit more than half of the oct nodes in a layer at a given time, which means that on the first layer we can hit at most 4 nodes, and then we can hit at most 16, and then at most 64, which gives us a sum that looks like this. Uh, this sum resolves to 4 to the d, where d is the number of layers, and since we've already stated that d is on the order of log n, it means that the reversal takes at most 4 to the log n time, which is still O of n. It's just a worse O of n than what we were doing previously. In the best case, octrees allow us to rule out intersections with objects in the scene by containing a large number of empty oct nodes. This means that if we shoot a ray at the tree and we miss, or if we miss all of the nodes inside of it that contain objects, we can very quickly throw that ray out and know that we're not going to return a color. We ran some benchmark tests on different types of scenes to show the effect of octrees and multi-threading. Uh, in this case, this is a very simple scene, uh, and it very clearly shows that octrees don't help you at all when you have a very small number of objects. Uh, in fact, it took basically twice as long with the octrees in place than it did without them. Multi-threading doesn't help us much here either because of the overhead costs associated with starting, running, and then reconciling threads. This is a much more complicated scene. It contains around 500,000 triangles, uh, and it pretty clearly shows that octrees can have a really positive impact when they're used in the right context. Uh, here, as you can see, with only multi-threading, it would have taken us roughly 10 hours just to render this one scene, uh, but with octrees and multi-threading enabled, it only took around 11 seconds. To finish things off, I want to show a couple of extra features we included with our ray tracer. Um, first off is anti-aliasing, which is a pretty simple technique for smoothing out your images and making them look uh, nicer and more realistic. It does this by taking every pixel and sampling it multiple times, and then averaging those samples together. This gives you a pretty massive increase in image quality, while only requiring a linear increase in computation time. We also included support for rendering arbitrary triangle meshes. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to design a mesh in a 3D modeling program like Blender, and then to export it as a .obj file. We also have support for parsing the materials present in these files, since we're using a standardized version of the Fong Illumination model. Uh, we also included a graphical user interface that makes it pretty easy to load in meshes, modify their parameters, and render scenes. Um, these scenes can then be saved and loaded uh, however you like, uh, we've included a couple test scenes with our package to get you started. That wraps things up for today. Thank you very much for watching, and please check the links below the video for more information about the project.